Our chapel speaker today is Dr. David Lowry, who will be retiring this June after 42 years of teaching and faithful ministry in the New Testament department at Dallas Seminary. David was born in Lancaster, PA, and at the age of one, his family moved to Texas, where his father, Fred Lowry, began his studies at DTS. After seminary, the Lowry family moved back to Pennsylvania, where David later attended King's College and met his soon-to-be wife, Deborah. And after college, Dave decided that he wanted more biblical training, and of course, he came to DTS, where he earned his THM degree in 1975. And a few years later, he was asked to return to DTS to teach in the New Testament Studies Department. He's been involved in church planting and ministry in various churches for over three decades in both Vermont as well as Texas. He and his wife, Deborah, have three children, all who attended DTS and all married DTS classmates. Uh, they are blessed to have seven grandchildren with an eighth that is due within a week or two. In his spare time, he enjoys his gardening, his cat, Belle, his pug, Bruce Wayne, <laughs> along with being a, a very avid bird watcher. However, the true joy for him is spending time with his wife, children, and grandchildren. David, thank you for your many years of faithful ministry to DTS, to the Lord and to his service. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. David Lowry to our platform this morning. I came to DTS in 1971 and joined the seminary soccer team. I, I don't recall that we had a faculty advisor. I think this was organized by students, but we had uniforms, we played in a city league, and we had officials that uh, were a part of every Saturday afternoon's game. Our team was made up of international students, students who had grown up on the mission field and so were well acquainted with the game of soccer, and then people like myself that had played in high school and college. We uh, did quite well in the league, mainly because we were younger than most of the other players. <laughs> on a particular Saturday afternoon, as I recall, we were playing a uh, Hispanic team, Mexican-American team from Oak Cliff. They referred to us, because they knew we were seminary students, as the Padres. <laughs> so we, the game went on, and uh, I was to play. My position was as a striker on the left side. This was a position I'd played all through college, and I knew my job was to put the ball in the goal. We had a very adept fellow at midfield who uh, made a nice pass to me, uh, looked to me like it was going to be an easy goal, and I went dashing after the ball. But then I felt someone grab the back of my jersey and pull me back. This was a fellow on the other team who intended to slingshot himself forward, and without thinking too much, I reached over. He was coming by me, pulling me back. I reached over slammed my fist on his chest as he was coming by, and he stopped immediately. He said, Padre, <laughs> what are you doing? I don't remember too much about uh, what happened after that, but I do remember going back to my uh, room. I was a single student thinking, what is wrong with me? I played Six years, I played in high school and college, never struck anyone on the field. Of course, I don't recall ever being grabbed and pulled back either, but um, I, I realized that my, one of my problems was presumption. I thought I was better off in terms of my relationship with the Lord and my Christian character than I was. And uh, this was something of a wake-up call to me about recognizing my own weakness and the need I had day by day to depend upon the provision of the Spirit for me. I took some consolation later reading from C.S. Lewis 
in a passage in Mere Christianity. Lewis was in his 40s when he was invited to make some radio talks on the BBC during World War II. And those talks became the book Mere Christianity that was very influential, it has continued to be influential until this day. And Lewis has a chapter on Christian behavior entitled Charity. Now Lewis was a man who was used to the King James Version, and in the King James Version, the Greek word agape is often translated as charity when it relates to our relationship with one another, how we are to be a people characterized by love for one another, but the word charity is used. So this was the heading of this particular chapter, charity for Christian behavior. And if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read a paragraph from that, since it seemed to relate to me as well. We begin to notice, he says, besides our particular sinful acts, our sinfulness, begin to be alarmed, not only about what we do, but about what we are. This may sound rather difficult, so I will try to make it clear from my own case. When I come to my evening prayers and try to reckon up the sins of the day, nine times out of 10, the most obvious one is some sin against charity. I have sulked or snapped or sneered or snubbed or stormed. And the excuse that immediately springs to my mind is that the provocation was so sudden and unexpected, I was caught off my guard. I had not time to collect myself. Now, that may be an extenuating circumstance as regards those particular acts. They would obviously be worse if they had been deliberate and premeditated. On the other hand, surely what a man does when he is taken off his guard is the best evidence for what sort of a man he is. Surely what pops out before the man has time to put on a disguise is the truth. If there are rats in a cellar, you are most likely to see them if you go in very suddenly. But the suddenness does not create the rats. It only pre prevents them from hiding. In the same way, the suddenness of the provocation does not make me an ill-tempered man. It only shows me what an ill-tempered man I am. The rats are always there in the cellar, but if you go in shouting and noisily, they will have taken cover before you switch on the light. Well, I saw the rats in my cellar that afternoon, and I recognized that as I came to study the scripture, that we deal with the reality of living in these mortal bodies with a propensity towards sin that is not fully and finally dealt with until we leave these mortal bodies and receive our glorified body. We are a people who need to be vigilant, watchful, as the Lord told the disciples. The spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. I think this passage in Ephesians is a good reminder for us as we go into ministry. And thank you, Eric. I wish I had your sonorous voice for reading that, uh, this passage. But let me make a few comments about it. Ephesians 4, 29 through 52. It's in the section where Paul is talking about Christian behavior how people who have a relationship with Christ should live. And in these five verses, there are five present imperative verbs, meaning this is to be an ongoing command that characterizes Christian experience to the end of our days. He says, let everything you say, this is the first, be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Let everything, when I, I recall reading that and thinking, 
That cannot be done. Everything that comes out of my mouth is not going to be good and helpful and build up those who hear. I am an outspoken person, so is my wife. And we have friends who some years ago gave us a plaque that we have put over the top of our back door as we go out. It's a short prayer that says this, Lord, let the words of my mouth be tender and gracious today, for tomorrow I may have to eat them. <laughs> In verse 30, Paul says, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. And I'm sure I grieved the Holy Spirit that afternoon. I wasn't mugging the fellow, but nonetheless, uh, what I did was wrong, and I'm sure the Spirit was grieved by it. Paul says, remember he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. The day of redemption is yet future for all of us. When Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 8, he celebrates the ministry of the Spirit. But there too he has a command in the present tense, and he says, we need to continually put to death the deeds of the body. We need to be a vigilant people, aware of our weakness, depending upon the Spirit to give us God's strength. In chapter 8, 13 of that same letter, he says, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. But he ends that passage by saying, and don't make provision, and again, it's the continuing tense, to fulfill the desires of the flesh. We still live with the flesh and this mortal body. One day the rats indeed will be eradicated, but that is yet future when the spirit brings about our full and final salvation. Get rid of all bitterness, he says, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, and here's our third imperative in the present tense, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And then in chapter 5, beginning in chapter 5, he begins with this fourth imperative, which strikes us, I think, most of us as impossible to do, as are most of the commands of Scripture, apart from the enablement of the Spirit. He begins by saying, imitate God in everything you do, because you are his dear children. The word, it's in the context of forgiveness and love and caring for one another. Again, this passage, and we are to be imitators of God in the way we love one another. He, the fifth imperative begins verse two. Live a life filled with love. We are to live in such a way that the love of God is manifest in our relationship with one another. Follow the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. The self sacrificial love of Christ is to be our model throughout our life as the people of God in our relationship with one another. This past Christmas, I reread a story, a short story, that I had read as a schoolboy. It was written by a fellow whose pen name was O. Henry and was entitled The Gift of the Magi. And I remember reading this in school and um, thinking a little bit about it then, but not too deeply, and reread it uh, this past Christmas. It's, many of you may be familiar with this story. It's about a young couple who come to the Christmas season and they are living uh, by a shoestring and they don't have the money to buy a gift for one another. So both of them wonder what they can do. The wife has been gifted with lovely hair, beautiful head of hair, and she decides to visit a wig maker and see what the wig maker will pay her if she has her hair cut and sells it to him. 
The wig maker gives a good price and she says, thank you, cut my hair, I'll take the money. And with the money, she goes out and buys her husband a gold chain for his pocket watch, a treasured pocket watch that he carried with him. The husband, in the meantime, he too is wondering what he can do to raise some money to buy a gift for his wife. He decides the thing of value he has is this pocket watch. So he goes to a pawn shop and he sells the watch to the pawnbroker and with the money decides to buy his wife a beautiful set of combs for her hair. And O. Henry uh, ends the story with this paragraph. When they come together on Christmas Eve and realize what they have done, they say only, well, let's have dinner together and enjoy the season. Uh, O. Henry ends with this paragraph. He writes this. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the newborn Christ child. They were the first to give Christmas gifts. Being wise, their gifts were doubtless wise ones. But here I have told you the story of two children who were not wise. Each sold the most valuable thing he owned in order to buy a gift for the other. But let me speak a last word to the wise of these days. Of all who give gifts, these two were the most wise. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are the most wise. Everywhere, they are the wise ones. They are the magi. I remember the first time I read this, I found that last concluding paragraph somewhat curious. I would have recommended more communication in the marriage. <laughs> but O. Henry's point was, if you act self-sacrificially out of regard for another person and you love them that way, even if your love is misguided, it will, you will be a wise person in the way in which you live your life. Not everything works out the way we wish it would, but if we live self-sacrificially in relationship to one another and truly love one another, we will be living wisely. We will indeed be wise people. And I trust that will mark you in the days ahead. Let me conclude with a, a short uh, summary of a presentation on the evening news. <clears throat> now, I recognize most of you probably do not get your news from broadcast television. Um, I say this because as I watch the evening news, most of the commercials seem to be medicines targeting old people. <laughs> and my grandchildren, when they come to visit, they say, Grandpa, we are not supposed to watch the news because it's mostly bad things and scary things. And I tell them, well, that's true. I'm just trying to watch out, you know, avoid these things. But you go read a book. I'm watching the news. <laughs> and it is true, 25 minutes of a 30-minute program on the news is mostly bad news. But most of these programs try to end with an upbeat story of one sort or another. They try to go out on a positive note. And Steve Hartman, uh, has continued the tradition of, in CBS News of doing a little vignette entitled On the Road, where he goes around the country and visits with different people, tells different stories. And last year ago, May, uh, the story appeared of a fellow, a young boy, a four-year-old boy in Birmingham, Alabama. His name was Austin Pirine. Austin was watching a nature program on television with his dad about animals who needed help from humans. They had been separated from their parents or for various reasons needed to be taken care of before they could return to the wild. And after the show was over, Austin asked his dad, are there people who need help? 
like this. They need, need a place to stay or they need food. And his dad said to him, yes, um, we have people even in downtown Birmingham who don't have a home, may need to eat. And so, yes, there are people like this. And Austin said to him, can I use my allowance to go to Burger King and buy some chicken sandwiches for anyone who needs one? His dad said, sure. So off they went to Burger King. I don't know what the size of his allowance was, but um, <clears throat> in the picture, uh, in the account by Steve Hartman, he was dragging a bag of sandwiches. He was also, I think Steve caught up with him after he'd been doing this for a few months, because Steve also said the management at Burger King heard what he was doing, and they gave him a $1,000 scholarship to buy chicken sandwiches. So he had a pretty good bag of chicken sandwiches he was dragging, and his associate was his dad, who carried bottled water to give out. And so when Austin would come to someone on the street in downtown Birmingham, and he said to them, would you like a sandwich? And they'd say, yes, thank you, give them a sandwich. He'd say, you're welcome, and don't forget to show love. And on his shirt, he had a shirt printed up that said, show love, and his name at the bottom, Austin P. Ryan, president. <laughs> and uh, Steve Hartman said to him, uh, you look like you're a pretty small company. He says, yes, it's just me and my dad. Um, and he said, but I've got to go to school next year, so I don't know of how long I'll be able to do this. Um, <laughs> You are probably aware of the complications of going to school and ministry, but uh, I thought it was a great story and a good reminder for us that even a child, a four-year-old boy, can show us the way in terms of how we are called to relate to one another and to be a people who are characterized by love in this world. Let us indeed be a people who stay dependent on God, always aware of our weakness, and our need of the Holy Spirit. The day of the redemption is coming, and these rats in the cellar will be eradicated. But until that day, let us remain vigilant and dependent upon God for our strength. And in the days ahead, if anyone should ask you, what are you doing? I hope you'll be able to say, I'm imitating God. I'm showing love. God bless you.